Hello everybody, this is Brian Zajac from the CG School. Um, welcome to the Photoshop Beginner to Intermediate uh, one hour free webinar class. Um, I thank you for joining me. This is a partnership between CG Architects, Vine 3D, and 3D ATS. So let's go ahead and get started with our agenda first. All right, so today we're going to cover a few things. Uh, this is more new stuff for CS5. I thought I should cover today. We're going to, the, the first thing is actually uh, covered, and I believe they started it in CS2 or CS3. It's the uh, smart objects. I'm going to talk about smart objects versus regular objects or the not so smart objects. Um, then we're going to go ahead and move on to the vanishing point filter. Then we're going to end up with the puppet warp. We're going to take a palm tree. Uh, via the 3D ATS 3D Share program, which I'm going to show you here, you can find that information when you go to 3dats.com. You click on this Create Share comment or Share and Download Free Onyx 3D Vegetation. You click on that. Go to the Silver Date Palm. Click on that image, and right click and save image as. So. That'll be the file I work with. So again, we're going to go with Smart Objects, Vanishing Point, and then Puppet Warp. So let's go ahead and dive right into the Smart Objects. I've got Photoshop open here. A few things to keep in mind. I'm working with the Essentials tab. Um, I suggest you do the same. However, if you know Photoshop pretty well, um, you know, do whatever way you want, but um, what we're taking a look here is two cars. One car is a smart object, the other car is not. Um, and I'm going to go ahead and move this up a little bit so that we can see more layers, because some of this stuff is just not needed. Okay, so we have this car that has a mask in there, and again, um, this is all explained in the two-day uh, webinar that we do. Um, this is just the portion of that. So for some of you, it might be difficult to get some of the lingo. For other of you, it might be just as the, like the back of your hand. I, everybody's from every different skill length here, so um, I'll do the best I can to make this all work. So anyways, um, if you take a look here with the not-so-smart car and the smart car, which is here on layer uh, 3, The first thing you need to know about smart cars, or I'm um, sorry, smart cars, smart objects, is um, scalability. If you go under Edit, Transform, Scale. Now, if I if I go down, if I really squeeze that down to small, and then I put it back up. Okay, you see how it's all fuzzy. It doesn't remember the information. It's not smart. So. Our goal is to work on something that's a little bit smarter than that, and that's where smart objects come in. And yes, I'm going to say smart a lot here, but it's just the way it works. So let's go on to the smart object. If I scale her down a little bit, oh, I'm sorry. One thing I forgot to show you, and I'll tell you more about this later, is the, uh, the shadow here. I'm going to go ahead and shut that off. And I'll explain why that doesn't work in a bit. So let's go and scale this down. And let's go ahead and scale her back up. As you can see, no degradation. Why is that? Because Photoshop is remembering the data from an external file. A smart object is a file that references back to an original file. And because it does, it remembers that information instead of the information that is actually in this file. So you have a smart object and you have the not-so-smart object. And just here, I'm just clicking on the history button. So for you who don't know what the history is, I'm just going back to the original file so that um, so everything's evened out correctly. So the one thing that people need to also know about is that there are some parts that are not um, that cannot be cannot work with it. Um, for example, this sh shadow layer. If I turn on the road that I the road thing here, you'll see that we've got some blending here and here. However, 
if I try to make this a smart object, which as I go through this, you'll, you'll see why, um, I have a blending option on here called hard light. And this blends the best for the shadow that you see here. This shadow here, that's blend better instead of hard light, instead of using it on normal. See how it has that white kind of fringe around it? Well, if you put on hard light, it blends better because that's the way it works. Um, blending, again, will be taught more in the today class. So for now, um, you can't make that a smart object because you're blending in this this um, uh, this file itself. It's not from the external file. And if you try to put the these um, try to make a smart object with a hard light in the blending, it actually makes a hard light for both the car and the shadow. So it doesn't it doesn't really work right. And it, it just trust me on this one. There are just some things that you have to play around with that work, and some things that don't work. But on typical one object kind of things, it works great. Um, just some of the transparency is a little bit off. Okay, so with that with that done, um, there are ways to make it um, a smart object act differently. Like, for example, if we take off the road layer and we can take this same car and, and duplicate it a bunch of times. In fact, let's just go ahead and do that. If I just take this, I'm sorry, we have to go to the car smart layer. And actually, let's just duplicate that layer. <laughs> um, let's go under, uh, right click on the layer and click um, duplicate layer. And we'll call this the um, small car. And since we have a folder called smart cars already, let's call it smart car too. Okay, so all I did was press Control T. It did the same thing as Edit, um, Transform, uh, Scale. This is transforming or scaling or doing a bunch of stuff to the object itself. So we're going to scale that down and make it nice and small. Okay. Move this up here. Now, here's the way that smart objects work. Uh, on an external file. If I double click on the car smart layer here, it's going to go to an external file that in contains that information. And here's our smart car. Now, if you notice on here, on this, on this file, um, we can do a right click on it and do blending options. We're going to change the color of this car. And we'll put this over here. So to go back again, if you right click on the layer, remember you have to be in that external file to make this happen. Right click on the layer, click blending options. Then click color overlay. Then click, instead of normal, put it on color. Boom, you got a nice really red car. But we'll take that red color and we'll make it a little bit nicer. And again, this is a very quick and dirty way of doing it. You can be able to mask out areas of it so that the that the actual car itself is a different color and not the wheels and so on and so forth. Again, you would know that more by uh, tracing paths or uh, or masking it out or doing some of the other functions that Photoshop has to make that happen. And it's totally possible. So just press OK there. We press OK. And then... We have to save the file. So file, save, but do not close it, okay? So now we've saved the file. Now watch what happens when you go over to the other file. See? This changes and that changes. Now, that's going to come in very handy when you want to duplicate objects many times over. For example, trees in a scene. So you've got, um, you've got a bunch of different trees that you want to go ahead and have a certain set of you know, palm fronds on, on those palm trees. Well, you can be able to take that and then duplicate it as many times as you want so that when you change one, it changes them all. 
Now that's fantastic because before, if a client says, well, you know, that palm tree top isn't so hot. I, I really wish you could tweak it and tweak this group of area, you know, of, of trees. Well, before, the problem was is that if you were really detailed, you'd have to do that for every single tree, which would take up a lot of time. But with this, with the smart object, you make it the change to one function, and it changes it all. Now, I'm sure some of you out there are saying, well, that's nice, but what if I only want to change like groups of trees, like let's say I've got some palm trees that I want to have more kind of like a burnt looking, or not burnt but dried out leaves, and other palm trees that are more healthy looking. Well, that's no problem either because you can actually duplicate smart objects um, with, this, with this command I'm going to show you here, um, and that is um, we're going to highlight that layer, that car smart layer again, okay, and we're going to go under edit, um, actually, it's under, I believe, give me a second here. It's under layer, that's right. Layer smart objects, new smart object via copy. So on this one, we made a new layer, and we're just going to call this car smart um, different car, just so you can see. Okay, so we'll move that car up here, and just to make it look different, we're gonna change, we're gonna uh, rotate it. So go under Edit, Transform, Flip Horizontal. So it's Edit, Transform, Flip Horizontal. Boop. See, now it's flipped. So let's scale it down again. Control T, or go under Edit, Transform, Scale, Scale it down. Voila! Now. Remember how we have to double click on the smart layer? Double click. Okay, let's go to that. Now, let's change that color. I'm sorry, let me show you what I did. I just double clicked the effects word here, the word effects, and it's just a quick way to get to where you need to go to blending the options once you've already made them. So you click on color overlay, we'll make that uh, green. Again, any green's fine. Save the file, keep it open. Let's go back to the other one, and voila. So you see, you can still have separate smart objects themselves. So you can have things both your way. So let me just keep this little oddball here, and I'll show you what I mean. So you can see you've got two different ways to approach it. You've got your own set of groups of other smart objects, and you've got your ones that you can stay consistent with. And, if, and again, you can duplicate these all you want all day. In fact, I'll, I'll uh, you know, if I, if I duplicate this and I move it over, and I go back to Car Smart 1 PSB, change the color, make that a light blue, save the file, go back to the original, see, it affects them both. So you can see you've got two different complete sets on there. You're good to go. So <clears throat> you can affect it at different ways as, as much as you want. So let's get rid of those different cars. And let's go back to the other one that, remember, this is the original one, and we made a small version of that. Now, again, for those who don't know, all you do is you highlight, you, you can click on the layer and drag the layer to the trash to get rid of it, or on the layers here, if you hold the shift button and go down to the other one, you can highlight both of them. Or the control button also works, too. What's good about control is you can select multiple layers um, anywhere you want. If you hold down the shift, watch what happens. It selects all the stuff below. So that's the difference between selecting stuff in layers with the control key versus the shift key. But for right now, we just want to um, trash the smart different cars and drag them to the trash. Okay? So they're dragged and gone. Now remember that other small car here? I'm just showing you that we can duplicate that as all day long.
And one of the things I like to do is be organized. So a uh, way to be organized is to make a new folder. So we'll make a new folder and call this, oh, I'm sorry, new uh, group. And call the group, double click on the word group. It should highlight that. Call that small cars 2. We're going to then take and click on each individual one here. Drag it to there. Now it's in the folder. You can see that it's hidden there. In fact, if you click on the little arrow, see how they're gone? Okay. So we can keep duplicating that. I'll do one more just for the heck of it. In fact, I can show you something else that's kind of cool. Uh, if I hold all three down with the shift key, now I've got all three selected. If I right click, I click duplicate layers. I believe that this will work. Let's watch. And I just hold the shift key and drag it over. See, I've got three more cars. Now, if I change this one, do you think it'll change the rest? It'll change this whole folder of cars or this whole group of cars? Well, let's watch out. Let's watch. So if I double click on this, again, go back to that other smart car. You're right back at it. We'll change the color again. And we'll go to make that, um, just make it, oh, that's an ugly color. Just go make it green again. Save the file. Now watch what happens. Ta-da! See, so you can really affect a large amount of objects by uh, taking care of the source object. And that's what I typically have done before. I would actually change this in many cases to, you know, I would change this. If, if I really worked in the file itself, I would change it to small cars to source. That way I know that that's the source object it's working from. Um, again, the other ones can work with the source object, like watch. If, if I, for example, if I trash this car, um, and then I double click on one of the other small ones, it'll still go to that smart object. But in my mind, it's psychologically easier to have a source file that I, I go to as my go-to guy, and then just change the parameters and everything else. Okay? Go back to my history. Bring that back up. Okay, so that's in essence how smart objects work. They're, um, you know, you can again, you can scale them uh, as much as you want. Now, again, if you scale them larger than what the original file is, like for example, if I scale this here, something way bigger, you'll start to see it gets a little bit fuzzy because it's beyond the original size of the smart object. But if it does not go beyond the size of the original smart object, it's all good. So you're fine. Um, the last thing is that whole shadow deal I'll show you. Let me get rid of, let me dump out the small cars too, get rid of those. And again, I have it in the example file where you have like the cars already done for you. Nice and neat with them being masked out. In fact, if I can remember, I bet you I, I did that already. So you don't have to look at this, but I'm just looking for myself. It looks like I just erased it out or, yeah, now here's the mask. I think I work on a mask here, so uh, you guys can check it out whenever you want to. Regardless, um, I think I got the, at least got the wheels. I know that for sure. I'm not sure about the light, but um, it's still there and uh, it works all good. So you guys can test as much as you want. So if I, anyways, going back to my other thing, if I go back to the road, some objects cannot be smart. Um, for example, this uh, this shadow here. If I go to the original uh, smart object, which is here, double click on the uh, smart object uh, thumbnail layer there, and I already had pre-made a shadow here, and remember how I put that. I'm going to get rid of the color overlay so that it goes back to the original car. I just clicked on the little eye here, and it turns on and off. So if I click on shadow, um, and I make that, remember it's on hard light. So it's already set up for hard light. Everything's set and done. So if I save that, watch what happens. See, it's still got the same fringe thing. 
So some things have to be outside of the smart object to make them work effectively. So what I had to do here was I had to go and shut off the shadow layer here, save it out, go back to the original file, and turn on the shadow that is within the file that uses hard light. Because it's outside, it cannot figure out how to blend that correctly with the current scene that, that I have. That's why you have to bring some stuff that blends differently within the actual original root layer that you or root file that you're working with. So keep that in mind when you guys are doing um, um, your different uh, smart objects. But that, in a nutshell, is pretty much how smart objects work. I highly suggest you experiment with them and and work with them because they're they will be a great time saver for you and. Um, especially if you have a picky client. They will save you lots and lots and lots of time. So let's move on to the next one. I'm going to close this out. Don't save it. Get rid of these. And go back to our next support files. We're going to move on on the agenda actually here to uh, the vanishing point. Now this is a new filter, as far as I know it was a new filter for CS5. It might have been for CS4, but um, I just started using this and uh, it's pretty new to me. In fact, it's got some funky things that can happen within it, but the overall idea I think would be good for architectural visualization, um, as you'll see here in a little bit. So we're going to go ahead and click on the vanishing point interior room. This is the original room itself. It had this kind of window here. Now, I really don't have time to show you, but I got rid of the wall and put this painting in here. But before I can show you how the whole painting works nicely in here like this, I have to show you uh, another step um, by opening up the painting.jpg file. That is this one right here. So if we just click on this, now we click, this is what's tricky about CS5. Don't click and drag within the file here because it'll actually place it in the file. Watch. See how it places it in there? I don't want that. So I just hit escape, the escape button on the keyboard. Get rid of it. And let's go back to the painting. We need to drag that up here. Um, I believe that we can do it. Here we go. So just anywhere outside the document itself, it'll open up in a new kind of tab, okay? Now, the original photo that was taken of this painting um, was, is not completely correct because it doesn't uh, comprise of a perfect rectangle, as you can see here. So what I'm going to show you is a little trick that I use for uh, adjusting um, it so it distorts correctly. So if I just zoom in a little bit here, I hold down, by the way, if you want to zoom in and move around, you hold down the space bar and it changes to a hand so you can move it around. So you hold down the space bar, move with your left click, and you can be able to you know, do what you want. Now, the way to make this distort correctly is like this. You click on the uh, polygon lasso tool that you see here. We're going to select around the rectangle or around the painting itself here. There are many ways to do it, but I just think this is the best way to kind of do it. If I hold down the if I hold down the space key again and go to the hand, I can move my document down a little bit more. Okay? So now I can get to where I need to go zoomed in. So you get better results. So we'll keep moving this. And voila, you have a selection. For those of you who don't know exactly how to do this, I've actually gone ahead and in the Paths tool uh, tab here, I have this thing called a Painting Path. So what you can do is, for those who couldn't follow along with that, if you just click on Painting Path, right-click on that and click Select Make Selection, feather it for zero pixels, you get the same result. Okay? So now we have a selection set. Now what we want to do is go under Edit, Transform, Distort. Now here's what I like to do. You, it's under completely under your discretion, but I hide this stuff because it's hard for me to budge this right with all this stuff going on. I've got you know this transform um, uh, 
uh, gizmo going, and then I've got these marching ants going, and it's just too much stuff. So I press Control H, and I hide it. Press Control H again, and you see it again. So H, Control H is to hide. So we take it and we move it. See how it goes from black to gray? We know we're touching a point. So we take that and move that over. And guess what? We're going to do that for every single corner here. Hold down the shift key to move the hand. Move it again a little bit. And one more time. Now this is pretty much where you want to be at. Press Control H to see it again. Press Enter to confirm. There is also a checkbox here, I believe. You can click on that checkbox up there, and it does the same thing. So there you go. Now it's distorting correctly. So here's what we got to do. We got to take this painting and we got to bring it into the other um, into the other uh, file that we have here. So we go under under Edit. Actually, I press Control A for Select All. Um, I don't usually do it. There we go. Select All. Select All. Then Edit Copy. So now you've copied the object, and we go back in here. And we go under Edit, Paste. Okay, so now we have a gigantic painting in our room. That obviously will not work. So what we have to do now is make sure we're in the right layer. So click on the Layers tab. You see it's called Layer 1. Change that to Painting. Call Painting 2, just so you can see the difference. Now, you'll go then to Edit. Transform, Scale. Hold down the Shift key. Scale her down. Have it similar in size. Now, for those who want to be perfectionists, I understand I'm similar in effect, and that's cool. Put the opacity down a little bit. Okay? Now you can kind of see it moving along. Um, and again, hold down the Shift key and just move her down to the round the original size. And there you go. Ta-da! Now, for those who are really perfectionists, we can zoom in and see how it doesn't line up totally. Well, let's see if we can press hold Control T and again move her so she's just about perfect there. Obviously, there's going to be a little bit of discrepancy, but that's okay. So we're going to take that opacity and bring that back up. So voila, you've got a painting that's around the same size as the other one. The only thing that's left to do that's different, if you notice here, I put a little kind of like drop shadow here so it kind of blends into the into the back nicely. So what you want to do is the same thing. So we will right click and click blending options. As you notice so far, I love my blending options because they're very adjustable and I, I, I just they're great to work with. I've been working with them for years and it's going to be hard for me to get away from them because they're just so uh, adjustable. Let me make sure I don't have the actually I have the let me cancel that real quick. Turn the painting uh, off and right click and click on blending options again. Go to drop shadow and it makes its default nasty drop shadow. Click off, use gold, global light. Take this so it's at, move, move this around, see how I can move around. And go to, I just put in zero. And then take the opacity, bring her down a little bit, bring her down to around, oh, I'd say about 25%. Might be good. And then we want to make the distance a little bit less, the size to nothing. Move the distance over again. And there you go, right there. Actually, take the opacity down just a little bit more to around about 15%, and that's good. So now it, it has a little bit of a, as a painting goes, it has a little bit of depth to it. So if I scale out, as you can see, painting looks fine. All right, now let's work on what we wanted to work on in the beginning, which is trying to work with the vanishing point, um, the, uh, the 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 vanishing point filter. Before we do that, I have you have to do one last thing. For some reason, I think vanishing point hates layers. 
So vanishing point is one of the last things you want to do um, when you're updating a file. To make things as easy as possible, I'm going to go ahead and go to Layer, Flatten Image. Discard the hidden layers, that's fine. Okay. Now, let me zoom out just for a second here. And zoom back in. I want to make sure I'm seeing everything I need to see. Okay, so I want to make sure I'm seeing the top edge and the left edge so that when I go to do this, you'll understand. Go under Filter, Vanishing Point. Okay, so this is how Vanishing Point works. It basically is kind of like a perspective changer. Um, it's very, very interesting how they came up with it. And, and uh, what you can do is you can apply an object that's currently in the scene to another part of the room in a different perspective. So this can come in real handy when you've got a deadline going on and uh, you don't have to re-render out you know, a new painting uh, in the scene that the, that the client wanted. You can do something quick in Photoshop to make this happen. So the first thing we do is we make sure that this is on the Create Plane tool. We create a plane here, here. You don't have to be perfect right now, but you encompass in the room. Now I got lucky, it's blue. For some of you it turned probably yellow, some of you others it probably turned red. Um, there, see how it was red? It, if it's red it says I can't do this. If it's yellow, it says, I might do it, but you're not going to get good results. You want to make sure it's blue. So make that one there. Then click on Create Plane Tool again, and you're going to make one up over here. Again, kind of follow. Unfortunately, my resolution is not so hot, so this will just have to be good enough. So we're going to adjust this so it's right. All I'm doing is just moving the handles, or at least trying to. Unfortunately, my, my window's so small it can't do this justice right. So th this will be good enough for what you guys are wanting to do. Okay, so getting on to the nitty-gritty of it, what we want to do is we want to click on this one again so we bring this back up. Um, this uh, plane tool or this plane area here. And we want to take the painting by using the marquee tool. Go over it this way. Now, this is where it gets a little bit like that, what I call wonky. If, um, if you, you have to click on the control key, click it once, and then you can, I believe, drag it over. See, sometimes it doesn't work. So you press, I just tried to click and drag over and it didn't work. See how that changed now? But after I drug it, I, by the way, if you want to undo anything, it's control Z to undo something. Um, you have to, uh, it's just weird. You have to move it a little bit to make it work. I'm still working on it myself, honestly. Um, it's just one of those things that's hit or miss right now. So future versions, I hope it'll make it. Anyways, we'll take this push this guy over here. Oh no, it's gone. Kind of. But look, watch that. See that? Pretty cool, huh? It changes it to the perspective. Now for those who don't like upside down paintings, like most of us do, there is a transform tool you can use by pressing the T command or pressing this little guy here. And let's just rotate that. If we hold down the shift key, it rotates perfectly. And we can even squeeze her in if we wanted to totally up to us. You move it, press enter, and voila. You have a painting, uh, 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 another painting on there in your scene. Now again, this probably is a little distorted and all that stuff, but for demonstration purposes, you can see the good potential behind this. You can make multiple paintings of the same thing. You can, you, you can do a lot with the vanishing point. Um, I've actually used it on buildings to create um, like text. You can use text on a building, on a, like a building, like a side of a building, and you can use the vanishing point to adjust your artwork or your text that should go on that wall. Uh, like a nice script font or whatever you can use, and you can put that on the wall, and it adjusts itself to the, what the vanishing point shows. So as you can see, it's very powerful if you're trying to 
put something on another object without having to manually distort things. It's, it's uh, computationally, it does work a little bit better with the vanishing point. So this is a nice little tool here that I find that works up pretty darn well. So that, in essence, is how that the vanishing point works, the vanishing point filter works. Keep in mind that, um, you know, that there are separate applications that we do this for, like the text one I was telling you about in the two-day class. So um, it's very possible to do it in multiple ways, and we get into blending options and all that stuff that you can add on to there. So it's, it, it's all good. But the other thing is, is that, again, it likes flat layers. It does work with, with or, I'm sorry, flat image. It does work with layers. Sometimes it gets a little bit more wonky. I just want to make this a flat um, system so that I wouldn't run into any other problems uh, during this demonstration. So that's the, that's the gusto behind that vanishing point filter. Okay, let's close out of this one and close out of the painting. Let's move on to our next part of the agenda. And that is the puppet warp. So today, I bet you thought that you weren't going to work with something called a puppet warp. But uh, it's, it's an interesting tool. Um, and it, again, works well. Uh, I think it works well for adjusting trees and distorting things in a, in a more uh, correct manner um, than your t typical distort tool that's out there. So with that being said, let's go ahead and start with uh, the the puppet warp. What we want to work with first is, um, it, well before we get actually onto that I almost forgot, um, I got this image. We're going to work with the silver date palm. That image again is if you click on 3dats.com, click on share and download free onyx 3D vegetation, which yes you can do that. You can share and, and get trees for your 3ds max scenes through 3dats.com. We click on silver date palm, and click on the image and you can right click and download that image now again if you didn't have that image um, you can get it this way but for others out there um, we had a support file area that uh, we we had mentioned earlier on um, again after this webinar is done that will not be available there anymore um, when we hopefully will have these videos if it records right um, we'll have that available as a link right next to the uh, to the webinar itself, so it'll be very simple to see. So let's, oh, I'm sorry, let's go ahead and open up that file. That is, we're going to work with the Silver Date Palm right here. Okay, and the Silver Date Palm, what we're going to do today is, I've, all, I've gone ahead and done the luxury of doing a lot of masking and taking out things and adjusting things. So if you take a look here, we have it on multiple layers here. We have the original background. We have the background blank. Now the way I did that, actually I should show you guys that. It's pretty, pretty cool. I'll show you a new feature called Content Aware. If I take the background and I duplicate the layer, so I'll call background um, content aware. And I want to make it look like this. The way I do that is I would normally have to take um, and clone this out. Um, a lot of you know what cloning and healing is already. Um, but it's basically, you know, uh, taking an area and trying to you know, get rid of it here. The healing brush sometimes doesn't work well, as you can see. Uh, you can use the, the standard cloning tool um, to make that work. By the way, to increase your brush size or decrease, you just click the little brackets on your keyboard, and it increases and decreases. It's a great time saver. Hold down the Alt key, and just click, and you can just take it off like that. Press Control z to undo. That's typically how you did it. Well, with Content Aware, it changed a few things, and in many, not many, but in some instances, you can get away with a lot with the Content Aware. So here's what I'll do. I will drag this over here. So the Marquee tool is encompassing both the shadow and the tree itself. Now remember, I'm trying to make it look like this, okay? So all I do is go under Edit, Fill, make sure it's got Use Content Aware, and press OK.
takes a little bit to go through. Take a look. Did a pretty good job at getting this stuff. Now, if I want to finish her off, I could probably use Content Aware again. I'll try it again. But I don't think it'll work totally right. But we'll try. No, it didn't work right. So what I do is I do, um, I, I make a selection, a marquee selection. I go under Edit, Transform, Scale, and I just move it over. Ta-da! Now, why did that work? Because it took the area that I was transforming and stretched it out. Since this is pretty much a, a, a gradient that stays the same throughout the whole way, it works great. And it's a quick way to do it. Now, I could have done the, you know, the spot healing brush or the clone tool or whatever to make that happen too. But for me, in some instances, it's much easier just doing it that way. So that's content aware. And then again, that's in CS5. So let me go ahead and get rid of that, work with background blank. And now what we want to do here is uh, we want to work with the blank. We want to work with the shadow. And we want to work with the tree. Okay, so we make sure that those are highlighted. The ultimate goal of what we want to do is we want to take the tree to make it look from this to this, or something similar to that effect. Because some palm trees have a nice bend to them. So how do we do that? Again, highlight the tree in the shadow. Make sure that the layers are on. And click on tree. Go under Edit, Puppet Warp. Okay, so now it's kind of look fuzzy all around here. It's got some stuff. So what we want to do is, in fact, I, let me see if I can turn on the other tree so I can match this. No, I can't. Let me escape out of this. I'm going to turn on both layers so you can see. I want to get to there again. So let me do the Puppet Warp. Edit, Transform. I'm sorry, edit puppet warp. So you're right here. We're going to go ahead and make some handles on here. You click on the base of it, and it makes a little handle there. Makes another one. And we'll make another one right here. So it takes some, you know, guessing work and stuff, but you click, left click on it, and you drag it over. So it moves the tree over this way. Then you take it over here. And so now, as you can see, you got a tree that's bending, but you got a problem here with the with the uh, the trunk. It's kind of lifted up. Well, that's e that's an easy fix. Click on the handle, go outside of it, and I believe ah, it's the Alt key. I think it's the Alt key. Hold on. Yeah, you hold the Alt key down, and you turn. Okay. Now you can press Control H to hide and see where you're at right now. I like to do that myself to adjust things just a little bit. And you can also add stuff onto here too. So if I want to add another controller on there, I can do it like right there. So we can even refine it. Now if we want to get rid of it, hold the Alt key and see the scissors that's on top of it, click on that, and boom, it's gone. And it readjusts itself. So to recap, all we do is we make handles here. We can adjust the handles by holding the, um, by clicking on it. Then after it's clicked on, hold the Alt key and adjust. See? And um, we can get rid of it by holding down the Alt key and going on, on it right here. Now remember, the Alt key, if you go on the Alt key around, after you click on it, you hold the Alt key and go beyond the yellow dot, it makes the turn, the, uh, the, the rotate transform work. But if you click on it and hold the Alt key down, it will get rid of it with the scissors. You just click on it after it shows the scissors, and you can remove it. So that's very handy, and uh, for those of you who are probably doing this right now, yes, you can make the, the tree dance a little bit more. So, And if you guys put a lot of handles on it, you can make it go really funky. So you can make her 
adjust real good. Or if you want to go go crazy, you can actually hold down the shift key, go multiple, and move the multiple handles around. So as you can see, you can really make or dance. See? So yes, today I taught you how to make your tree dance. So that is how the puppet warp works. Actually, let me get rid of the other one. Okay, so there you have it. You now have made a palm tree bend. Now, what about that shadow layer? Well, that shadow layer can actually, you can do the puppet warp to that too. Edit. Um, hold on a second. Oh, that's why. Hold on. Control H. Here we go. I don't know why it wasn't working, but uh, anyways, um, if it doesn't work for you, the many times it's because I've hidden the selections set. So all I do is I go back to the marquee tool, just click outside somewhere, and a lot of times that fixes the problem. So um, we can do a puppet warp to this uh, to this um, shadow too. So again, if I press Control H, I put on the original. I can adjust the the shadow just like that. There you go. You have now a a uh, new new kind of tree out there. So to compare with the original, so we're close. It gives you the idea. So that, in essence, is how the Puppet Warp works. It's a very handy little uh, feature, and I have actually used that on different palm trees and such, and it's been, uh, it's, it's worked out actually quite, quite well. Um, and uh, you can even get more advanced into it. Um, and I'm going to show you that now. We're 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 going to go into a little bit more advanced kind of file to show you how Puppet Warp can work along with, in conjunction with some of the other things you learned today, like the blending options and the and the smart objects and things like that. So let's close out of this. Control W or um, File Close. Don't need changes. Go back into our Puppet Example Enhance Palm. Okay, so we have an actual ArcVis scene we did for uh, a client uh, a little while ago. Um, and in this file, we have original trees that we had made in the rendering itself. Now, I'm sure you guys are guessing which tree we're going to work on, but you don't have to guess anymore. It's this one. As you can see, all this was adjustable in Photoshop itself. And what I did was, as you can see, these are all different smart layers here that I even work with. So I'll show you the different parts. We have the top, we have the trunk, and we have the shadow. Okay. So one of the things to keep in mind is, you know, if you have separate things, you can only puppet warp it separate. So if you want to get to make it look like that, you have to actually take um, and, and work with your smart objects. You have to really kind of work with your smart objects in a little bit different way. You have to combine two parts. Um, So what we can do is I, I can combine them both, but I could just I'm just going to show you some stuff that we already did with the uh, the the sh to, to modify the tree itself. We have a highlight layer, we have a palm top, and all this was done in 
this separate file itself. So you can do a lot of whole separate layers and then it all combines into one function there. So what we did was we have, uh, just so you know, we actually put in a separate gradient layer here in the, uh, uh, the layer styles here, the blending options, and we applied this gradient here to make it a little bit more brownish at the edge here. And we made it sure it was radial, and you can actually move the radius radiant around if I just click on it. Actually, you can actually adjust the amount of radius on there by the scalability here, so you can see that you can adjust it some more. So we can get very detailed with our smart layers itself. Um, that's just the, the palm top there. We added some more uh, effects into it and some highlights into it so it made it a little bit more lusher, a little bit more green up here. And again, we added its own gradient layer here. So we have a gradient layer of green and a gradient layer of brown. So once we've kind of put that all together, you know, every, everything's happy. It can finally turn out to be this way. Well, as you're making this, you want to make sure that they're source files, but I want to go ahead and take these two and kind of, kind of combine them. Um, you, you, again, you can adjust each individual if you really wanted to, but I, I, it does keep it same. There's two really schools of thought here. The first school is to keep things as the same as it can. But as you'll see here, if I go and edit Puppet Warp, I mean, I can adjust the tree like that and then go to the trunk, edit, Puppet Warp. And just adjust it that way. And again, I have to take this trunk here, hold down the Alt key, and adjust her. So you can take them separately themselves and still work with the uh, with the ones that you uh, want to do here. So it is possible. And so you can see we can we can just change that over. I just made a more funkier version. So the point is is that you can take separate and do separate uh, puppet warps to it. But personally, what I like to do is I like to a lot of times combine them if I know that this is what I want to kind of accomplish with it. And a lot of times, unfortunately, if you want to take the two, you have to. Um, combine them together to make it one so that you can puppet warp all of it together. Now again, that's completely up to your discretion. It depends how complex your object is. But uh, if I know for sure that this is what I want and the client's cool with it, then I would go that way. Um, but if not, you know, keep things a smart layer so that you can be able to adjust them accordingly. If it gets too complicated, then, you know, keep these as source files that you can work with later and then um, you know, work with the rest as you need to. So the only other thing I can tell you guys is um, really with, with, with Photoshop and CS5, there are many, many other things that we cover in the class. And in fact, if you take a look here and you click on this uh, double arrow key here and go to New in CS5, you can pretty much be assured that we go through almost all this stuff here in blue uh, throughout that two-day class. So, and, and also the fundamentals out there. We even go into lens collect, uh, lens correction. Um, we do get a little bit into 3D. Uh, I personally not a big fan 
of the 3D that they have in, in this. It's just too clunky right now. And um, in any case, we, we go into a lot more. Uh, we go into some brush presets um, and some other stuff here. But that's the new essential stuff in CS5. So to kind of recap over what we have done with the class, you learned that smart objects are pretty much uh, scalable. They're duplicate. You can duplicate them and you, work, you can work with them as much as you want. Um, they're, they're very adjustable to what you need. And you can add a lot of layers within its own smart object layer to really have a lot more control into your files. Versus the regular objects, which the regular objects have their own purposes, like that shadow layer I showed you. Uh, you have to have some regular stuff so it blends in with the scene better. But in most cases, smart objects should be uh, your normal base system that you guys have to work with. The vanishing point was a filter that was used, and I believe that's in CS4 or CS3 they introduced that. Um, that one there um, is great for adding elements onto interiors um, and just having them with a correct distortion um, from Photoshop itself. Again, it takes a little time to play with it, but it works. It's also great for putting anything on exterior walls. If you have a big, large wall or you need to, like, let's say you have a, uh, I believe in this file here. I'm not sure. Oh, we do have it. Great. Okay, so if we wanted to put, like, over instead of 3D Architectural Solutions, the client wanted to put his own banner there, you could copy the image and then put the vanishing point onto here and then reapply the banner so it's got the correct um uh, distortion or perspective to it uh, to make it work. And then we went finally on to the uh, puppet warp itself. As you can see, the puppet warp allows you to adjust not just things like trees, but shadows and practically anything. It's a new form of distortion. And I do recommend using it in a lot of different ways because, uh, you know, it, you'd be very surprised to see how powerful you can get with it. You can stretch stuff in a different way and it works. Other stuff is not great at all. It's a lot of trial and effort, but the point is, it still works out great. And, um, you know, it's, it's something not to just pass up by. It's, it, it, it's, I like it. Um, and also along with that, I showed you the content aware thing, which is basically like old Photoshop's um, healing brush kind of uh, way of doing stuff, but a little bit better. It, ha it, it picks from multiple spots within the scene to make it all work. Um, there are other tutorials that are plenty out there. In fact, if you just type in Photoshop tutorials, I believe the Adobe ones that they have can show you all the new stuff in CS5, and it works great. Um, but if you wanted to see how it applies to more to ArcViz, we have plenty of examples in our two-day webinar that's already been done and recorded. Um, I believe that's part of the recordings that we have. If you go to um, watch our recordings, it's right here. Um, we already have that available. If you need that, it's all set up and done for you. Or if you want to take the class, again, the early bird special is coming up soon. So that, in a nutshell, is our class today. Um, I want to thank you guys so much for attending. I uh, appreciate you being here, taking your time out to being able to learn the greatest and latest techniques in Photoshop and maybe how they apply to ArcViz and some of our scenes. Hope that some of this information will make your workflow much quicker, faster, more efficient and uh, just overall better. And um, again, uh, if you have any questions, just let me know. I'll be happy to answer them for you. Uh, we'll have the videos ready. I'm, I'm hoping soon if everything goes right and I end this webinar correctly. Um, have a great day, and I wish you guys all the best.